We all know of at least someone who either comes into a lot of money or gains a lot of followers and all of a sudden they turn into an entitled little jerk. Someone who suddenly feels untouchable, like they can do whatever they want to whoever they want and face no consequences. I don't know about you, but I can't stand to be around people like that. They hurt others and think that their followers and status will somehow get them out of it. So, when these people are forced to face the consequences of their own actions, it's just so, so satisfying. But before we get into the case, I have a bit of a different shout out today, and that is for one of my favorite true crime podcasts, Crime Weekly. Crime Weekly is hosted by private investigator and former detective Derek Lavasser and one of my favorite true crime girlies, Stephanie Harlow, who has over 800,000 subscribers on her own channel. I really like how Crime Weekly structures their episodes. They are very, very well researched and then they lay out each case with an engaging style of true crime storytelling. They really get into the nitty gritty of the case with exceptional detail of the who, what, where, and why. Then you get to hear the case from a detective's point of view, which really just brings it together and gives you a really good idea of what is going on behind the scenes of an investigation. Crime Weekly tackles lesser known cases like Connie DeBate and Danielle Redlick, as well as highly publicized cases like The West Memphis Three, Lori Vallow, and Adnan Syed. I actually listened to their series on Adnan Syed, as well as the podcast that originally covered his case years back, and let me tell you, Stephanie and Derek got into so much detail that my entire perspective of the case completely changed. I learned so much about the case that I genuinely have no idea how they were able to get their hands on so much information. The other thing I really like about Crime Weekly is that Derek and Stephanie always have really good banter and they aren't afraid to debate each other. They both will share different perspectives on the same information, which again, as a true crime consumer, I think is actually really important in these cases. Crime Weekly drops a new episode every week on YouTube and podcast platforms and you are sure to learn something new every episode. In addition to the case at hand, they also share tidbits on personal protection and how to protect yourself and your loved ones, which again, is very important with these cases. They are currently doing a deep dive on the Menendez brothers, so that is a case you are not going to want to miss. So make sure you check them out and give them a follow. Make sure to tell them that I sent you in their comment section. Okay, with that being said, let's get into today's case. 24-year-old Mahek Bukhari, or May, of Stoke-on-Trent in England was a rising star on social media. She was originally attending university studying fashion, but she would ultimately drop out because she started seeing more and more success as an influencer. At 24 years old, she had amassed 126 followers on TikTok, 43,000 on Instagram, and 4,000 on her YouTube, all where she would post content relating to fashion and beauty advice. In addition to her lifestyle content, she also frequently posted videos of her dancing with her mother, 46-year-old Anserine Bukhari. With all of these followers came money. She would make money from sponsorships on TikTok as well as the income generated from the videos themselves. As May made more and more money, according to friends and those who knew them, May and Anserine started to live a more flashy, luxurious lifestyle. They were living the high life, getting into clubs and lounges for free in exchange for social media exposure. Through the videos of them dancing together, getting food together, and clubbing together, fans watched as May and her mother showed off their elite relationship. May would say that her mom was more like a best friend and a sister to her. At the time, Aunt Serene was married to May's father, Raza Ali. But, as you can expect, the high life full of clubbing and being treated like famous royalty that can sometimes go straight to someone's head. Those who knew Anne Serene thought that it was very unusual just how much she would go clubbing with her daughter. She hung around all of May's younger friends, acting like a 20-year-old herself. It was just very odd to those who knew her and said that she didn't previously act like that. So, in 2021, when Anne Serene was 43 years old, she met an 18-year-old, Saqib Hussein from Banbury, on a video app called Azar. Those who knew Saqib described him as a beautiful presence in the lives of those who knew him. His parents would later say that he was their pride and joy. He was loving, selfless, and a great friend to those he cared about. When Saqib met Anserine, she was flattered by all the attention he gave her. The two started meeting up at different shisha lounges, otherwise known as hookah bars. 
This turned into meeting at bars and hotels, and ultimately, they started an affair. The two dated in secret for the three years that followed. It appears that although the affair was a secret to Raza, her husband, May knew about it and was either indifferent or she supported it. We don't exactly know. However, by around 1.30 a.m. on the morning of Friday, February 11th, 2022, police responded to a call regarding a horrible accident that occurred in Listershire. The caller told the police that they found a car which had crashed into a tree and was on fire so badly that they couldn't tell the make or the model of the car, and they couldn't even say if there was anyone inside. By the time police arrived, they discovered the burning car which appears to have crashed into the tree at a high speed before catching fire. First responders were able to put the fire out and it was at that time that officers discovered two bodies inside. The driver of the car would later be identified as Mohammed Hashid Ijizudem and the passenger was Saqib Hussein. The crash in the fire was so severe that I believe they had to be identified through dental records. So with how severe this crash was and the fact that two people were killed, police knew that they needed to carry out some sort of investigation to look further into what happened. Maybe this was the case of a drunk driver. Maybe there was an issue in the car that caused this. But after looking further into this, police realized that this may not be just a simple accident with horrific consequences. There was something much more sinister going on. Pretty quickly into the investigation, police connected a 999 call that they received just before finding that burnt out car, which tells a very scary story of what led up to the crash. The audio of this call has not been released, but they did release a transcript, so I will read some of it to you now. The call was placed by Saqib and reads as follows. Saqib, I've gone past the Sturgis garage in Leicester and I'm being followed by two vehicles. Operator, you're being followed by two vehicles? Saqib, yes. Operator, how do you know you're being followed? Saqib, they're trying to block me in. They're trying to block me in. Operator, can you get to a police station? Saqib, I can't get to a police station. I need help right now. He goes on to say, there's guys following me. They've got balaclavas on. They then talk about his location and in a horrified and panicked tone, Saqib repeats that he is being followed. He goes on to say, quote, they're trying to kill me. I'm going to die. Operator, calm yourself down a moment, okay? Zakib, I've gone past A607 Melton Mowbray and they're trying to ram me off the road. Two vehicles. They continue to talk about where he is and the direction he is going. He repeats that there are two cars trying to ram him off the road. He then says, I've gone past Ratcliffe College right now and they're trying to kill me. They're trying to kill me. They're crashing into my car. The operator tells him that they're trying to get help to come out. They talk about their direction again and he gives his name. He then gives the name of his friend that he's with, Muhammad. After that, he says, they're hitting the car. They're hitting the back of the car really fast. They're trying to ram us off the road. Please, I'm begging you. Then the call suddenly cuts out. The operator tries calling him back, but there's no answer. It is thought that this is the moment when the car crashed. Obviously, this call was very distressing. It is clear that someone may have targeted Saqib or Muhammad and wanted them to crash. That being said, this new information meant that the officers needed to look into the lives of both men to determine if either of them had any enemies. And that is when they made the connection. As I stated before, 21-year-old Saqib Hussein was in a relationship with 46-year-old Ansarine for the prior three years. However, turns out just before the crash, Ansarine tried ending their relationship. This was news that Saqib did not take well. When he found out that Ansarine wanted to break up, he begged and pleaded for her to reconsider. He was in love with her and didn't want to let her go. He tried calling her and doing anything he could to get her back, but that wasn't going to happen. She said that she made her decision. They were not going to be getting back together. In the face of this rejection, he turned to blackmail as a last-ditch effort. He threatened to expose the relationship to Ansarine's husband and threatened to release a sex tape as well as explicit photos that she sent him during the affair. In response, Ansarine told Saqib that she would go to the authorities and report him if he tried anything. But that isn't what Ansarine ended up doing. Instead, she turned to her BFF, aka her 24-year-old daughter, 
and told her what was going on. And instead of them going to the police together, instead of talking to Saqib and trying to give him time to see if he would just get over it, they took the situation into their own hands. According to text messages later found on Ansarine's phone, May texted her mom saying, I'll get him jumped by guys and he won't know what day it is. After these messages are sent, investigators found out that Ansarine spoke with Saqib, agreeing that she is going to pay him 3,000 pounds, which is about the amount that he spent on her throughout their relationship. In exchange, he had to delete the photos and videos he had of Ansarine. But Ansarine and May realized that even if they did pay him money to delete the videos and pictures, there was no way to prove that they were really gone. So, Ansarine told Saqib that they needed to meet up. During the meet, they would exchange the money, and he would prove that he deleted everything. After coming to this agreement, officers then found out that May had contacted a friend of hers, 28-year-old Rakan Karwan, asking him for help with meeting Saqib and getting this taken care of. After Rakan agreed to help, he enlisted several others to help. He contacted 23-year-old Raiz Jamal, 23-year-old Sanaf Gala Mustafa, 28-year-old Amir Jamal, and 23-year-old Natasha Akhtar. The plan was for all of these people to show up and hopefully with this group, they could intimidate Saqib into handing over his phone. So just after midnight on February 11th, 2021, Saqib got into his car and headed towards Tesco Car Park in Hamilton to meet up with Anne Serene and May. Little did he know, however, he wouldn't just be meeting up with these two women. Instead, he was about to be confronted with two cars packed full of people who were ready to do whatever it took to get rid of this problem. Police ended up discovering CCTV footage that showed Saqib and Muhammad driving to the Tesco car park at around 1.17 a.m. in Escoda Fabia, which is shown on video under a green arrow. The two men drive into the lot and park momentarily by the two other cars, a seat Leon and an Audi TT, which are shown with a blue and red arrow respectively. But almost immediately after parking, they leave again before the two other cars follow. It is thought that the two men may have seen all of those other people packed into those two cars. They got spooked, knew this was a setup, so they left without ever taking the chance of getting out of the car. After the cars leave the parking lot, CCTV captures the Skoda Fabia being followed by the seat Leon, which is then being followed by the Audi. They get to a red light, which the Audi blows through, before getting onto the A607 in Leicester. Near the end of the video, we see as the chase starts getting more intense with the two cars nearing the bumper. It was shortly after we see those cars driving along A607 that the 999 call was placed, and as we know, it was during this call when the two men crashed. After the Skoda Fabia crashed, CCTV footage, as well as later investigation of the Audi used in the chase, investigators determined that the cars reached speeds of up to 100 miles per hour during the chase. After getting to that speed, the Audi slammed on the brakes and reduced its speed to 62 miles per hour. After braking, the car continued down the A46 for several more miles before it reached an intersection. At the time, two people got out of the car and looked around for damage before getting back into the car. After checking for damage on their car, both the Audi and the seat Leon drove back past the area where Muhammad and Saqib crashed and presumably saw the burning car, but they did not call for help. Later in the morning, CCTV captures the same people who are believed to be in those cars walking down the road in Leicester as they made their way home. According to later investigation of cell phone data, it was confirmed that Mahik and Ansarin Bakari were walking down the road with the others who were involved and were all texting back and forth. After that, they made it home. After finding the burning car that morning, a forensic collision investigation took place to see how exactly this happened. They found that the Skoda Fabia had hit the barrier of the median or the concrete blockade to separate the lanes before colliding with a tree. The impact of the collision was so severe that the car split into two and the engine detached from the car. The car was estimated to have been going around 80 miles per hour when it crashed, which is just horrific to imagine. Both Muhammad and Saqib suffered multiple severe injuries, which killed them before the fire took place, 
So if there's any sort of consolation here, it's that they didn't burn to death. To summarize, police found evidence from Saqib's cell phone data that shows that he was in a relationship with Anserine. Shortly before the crash, Anserine broke up with him, which he was not happy with. Cell phone data showed that instead of reaching out to the police, Aunt Serene enlisted the help of her daughter, 24-year-old Mahek. She then contacted a friend who then contacted four others to help. Based on that, police found that there was this plan to meet up with Saqib and confront him for the phone. Using that, police found the CCTV footage which showed the cars that were known to be driven by the seven people involved chasing Saqib and Muhammad down the road. Based on that information, police went to the home where Anne Serene and Mahek lived and arrested them on suspicion of murder. At the home, body cam footage worn by officers showed that Mahek and Anne Serene confirmed that they were driving that Audi. However, they lied and said that they were traveling to Nottingham on the night and early morning hours of February 11th before heading straight back home. I don't know. Me and May went. No, yeah, we were. Where, were you, where was so that? We, where, so we first we stayed here and then we went straight to uh, Nottingham. Right. Okay. In the Audi. Yes. However, after their arrests, police did a forensic examination of the Audi as well as the C. Leon. As I mentioned earlier, it found that the Audi went upwards of 100 miles per hour before the crash. Investigators also found that there was damage to the front of the seat Leon that was consistent with the collision damage found on the Skoda Fabia. So, it is clear that this car was bumping into the car that Muhammad and Saqib were in, causing them to be run off the road. After being taken into the police station for questioning, all of a sudden, May had a new story of what happened. She explained how, when they were driving, they saw a blue seat Leon driving down the road past them. She said that she's a very good driver, so she doesn't speed and she makes sure to keep a good distance behind the car in front of her. But all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she said that the silver car comes zooming past them, cutting in and out of traffic, and is agitating the blue car. Basically, she made it seem like the silver car was harassing the blue car and wouldn't let the blue car leave, and the silver car was the one who caused a crash to happen. All the while, May was driving in her own lane, minding her own business, not involved in any of it. There's a car that's coming on the right-hand side, um, a Leon, Seattle Leon, don't know the model or anything, but it was blue, comes straight down, no speed, nothing normal on the right-hand side. We were always on the left-hand side. This right inside car's come now, the, the Leon, this, the blue one, has come straight next to me and come right in front of me, not very close. I've always said to myself, I'm a very good driver when it comes to this. I've been driving for five years, four to five years. And I've said to myself, always keep a second to three second rule gap always when I've said to myself, always done that. So this car's come not close, I've always braked. So I was doing 60, it was 70, I think it was 70 on the dual carriage or 60. I was doing 50 straight away, went back, went to 50 to 60, went back. This car didn't do anything to me. I don't know, it's the normal car going on the right to the left. The silver car, I don't, know which comp, I don't know which brand it was, model, it's come zooming down. I've kept this second, this second to three second rule gap and the blue Leon's in front and I'm at the back. This silver car's come and cut into the middle. So we're basically all three cars very close. I braked and I said to my mom, what is this car trying to do? And my mum said, May, just keep your distance. Everything's going to be okay. It's okay. Just a reckless few people just reckless because they know it's all the way down. If there's any cameras, going, there's going to be cameras. They, know, they must know there's no cameras. So they've gone all the way down. They've come cut into my, my car. I've kept my distance. I've braked. I was, I think, got to at least 40 because there was no cars behind me. Going to 40. This car was not threatening me, but agitating the blue car agitating blue so the blue car went onto the right lane which is the overtaking lane and the silver car went onto the right lane with the same car as the blue so then the blue car went onto the left and the silver car kept doing the left and it was just harassing like the car the blue car was trying to like trying to let you go like go 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 you can go now because i'm letting you go. but this silver car was not letting the blue car go so i was thinking okay well they're not agitating me they're not trying to put me off my driving i'm going on my left lane i'm further away from these cars so like i said they were doing their own thing i've gone past the on the right lane now the blue car's in front always the silver car was behind i've gone past and i've gone further away from this car on the left side 
and then the blue car has caught up with me on the right side. Not, I don't know who they are. I didn't even see the silver car as well. And the silver car, all I hear is like a, like a, you can hear like a bang, but not a big bang. It was like a, you hit behind me, basically. The silver car's hit the blue car at the back, like a touch. But you can tell the blue car has gone a bit faster. So I've looked at my mum and I goes, mum, what is going on? What is wrong with, are they, are they, I don't know if they're drunk. Are they, what are they trying to do to this blue car in general? So mum was me, like I said, leave it. You're not involved. You don't know what's going on. You just go straight on and leave it. I goes, okay, that's fine. This blue car's gone straight now. And this silver car's gone behind. And as soon as we're gonna, I said, mum, as soon as we see a slip road, we're gonna go, we're gonna go to a slip road. We've gone forward and the silver car's hit the back of the blue car. The blue car, see it like Leon's gone, completely gone. As soon as I've turned around, this silver car's gone out from the i didn't see all i've seen is they've hit and all i see is right like a, a, a swerved the silver car swerved to not my side to the other side of the dual carriageway where the, the metal bits are basically and i didn't see the car after that i didn't hear a bang i didn't he, apparently there was mentioned there was a tree i didn't see no tree i didn't see anything i've gone straight on i've looked at my mom and i said mom what I was just in shock. In the interview, after telling lie after lie, investigators actually played Saqib's 999 call for her to listen to. When hearing it, she did appear surprised, but she didn't admit to anything. She broke down into tears, but doubled down on her lies. Through hysterics, she said that Saqib lies so much and manipulated the series of events. But as we know, and as police knew at the time, none of what May was saying was true. They knew that May and Ansarine Bakari came up with this plot to meet up with Saqib and confront him. They then enlisted the help of five others, Rakan Karwan, Rais Jamal, Sanaf Agala Mustafa, Amir Jamal, and Natasha Akhtar. Based on the information we have discussed up to this point, all seven individuals were arrested on two charges each of murder. I do want to note at this time that there was an eighth person involved in the whole situation. His name is Mohammed Patel, but he was actually cleared of all charges because he cooperated with investigators and told them everything. He played a huge role in the prosecution being able to connect the dots and prove that this was an intentional murder and not just a reckless endangerment that led to two deaths. Mohammed Patel told officers about a phone call that he had during the chase where the defendants were talking about ramming Saqib off the road. So it's not totally clear whether he was actually present, which car he was in, or if he was just on the phone during it. My assumption is he was probably in the Audi while the seat Leon was ramming into Saqib's car, but what we do know is that he did have a conversation with the defendant as the chase was happening and found out all of this information about them wanting to intentionally ram them off the road. After the arrests of everyone else, pretty much everyone gave contradictory statements about their involvement and their motives. None of them had stories that lined up about what they were supposedly doing that night. Like I said, May claimed that she was just an innocent bystander witnessing this distressing chase between the two cars. Meanwhile, others who were with them claimed that they were involved in the chase, but it was only so they could stop the chase between the two other cars. Another story was that they were chasing the Skoda Fabia, but they only did it because they wanted to stop them and have a conversation with Saqib. One thing that was consistent between all of them, though, they never intended to drive those two men off the road. So, based on all of the evidence that police found up to this point, all seven defendants went to trial for two counts each of murder. The first trial took place in 2022, but was quickly declared a mistrial. This was because Anne Serene claimed at the trial that her relationship was just a one-off mistake with Saqib. However, it was during that trial when they found more information that would concretely prove how long the relationship was. They were able to access Saqib's iCloud account and found multiple text exchanges and pictures that proved that their relationship had been about three years in length. So, I'm not exactly sure what the reason is, but due to what was described as a jury irregularity, the first trial was abandoned. But finally, by August of 2023, 
18 months after the horrific deaths of Saqib Hussein and Muhammad Ijazudam, the trial for their murders started. I want to note that the investigation into this case was incredibly complex. For the months leading to the trial, the public had no idea what the other five defendants' involvements were. They only knew that May and Anserine were involved, but they didn't know why anybody else was arrested. All of the information that I've told you up to this point came together over the course of many months through a very careful and thorough investigation. At the trial, May described that her and her mother were like best friends. They had the best relationship and loved spending time together, which is why May always invited her out to party and go clubbing. She described that once she found out about the affair between Saqib and her mother, she lied to her father to protect their marriage. She would support her mother no matter what. But throughout the affair, Anne Serene apparently tried ending it multiple times. Every time, May said that Saqib would turn nasty and threatening. There were multiple times where Saqib threatened to come to the house. He threatened to expose her intimate photos and videos multiple times. She described that Saqib was a nasty, manipulative person and he was a narcissist and a stalker. Messages did prove that when Anserine tried breaking up with Saqib this final time, Saqib did behave in a way that was inappropriate. He told her that she was pissing him off by ignoring him and that she is going to regret ignoring him. He did blackmailing her, saying that he would expose the images of her to her husband. He also demanded that $3,000 back that he spent on her all throughout the relationship as a part of the blackmail. That is when May contacted her friend, Rakan Carwin, to sort out the money and get the phone. However, when she contacted her friend, she told him that Saqib had actually been blackmailing her, not her mother. That was an important distinction at trial because although these people did partake in the murder, they were misled as to why. However, the prosecution went out of their way to prove the numerous lies that the defendants were telling. They had videos of May and Anserine lying in their interviews about what happened. Both of them admitted to lying under oath to the jury. People in that courtroom really did not like any of the defendants in general, which already is not a good thing to have in a jury trial. If they're already very unlikable people, the jury will have certain biases when deciding a verdict. It's just human nature. Ultimately, the defense was claiming that the group was chasing Saqib, but only to stop him and have a conversation. But in the midst of it, Muhammad lost control of the car, and as a result, they died in a horrific accident. The prosecution detailed everything that we discussed up to this point, how instead of contacting the police and getting the blackmail resolved legally, they chose a violent route. They gathered a group of seven people, all to confront one man. There was a metal weapon found in the passenger seat of the seat Leon, so clearly they went to that meeting with the intention of harming him. Then, once Saqib refused to get out of the car, most likely after realizing he was in danger, he tried leaving, but the defendants wouldn't let him. Instead, they chased him off the road, causing a brutal, violent collision, taking the lives of Saqib, as well as his friend Muhammad, who had absolutely nothing to do with any of this a totally innocent victim who was in the wrong place at the wrong time. At the trial, Saqib's family talked about how, yes, the blackmail was wrong. You cannot deny that. Those messages Saqib sent threatening Anserine into staying in the relationship with him were wrong. But he was young and immature, very immature. His parents admit that flat out. But there was a much safer way to go about this. They could have gone to the police. They could have forced Saqib to take accountability in a legal way. There was absolutely no reason to resort to murder, especially now since they killed someone who never should have been there to begin with. Muhammad was described as a childhood friend of Saqib's. When the meetup was planned, Saqib was probably sketched out, so he brought his good friend with him to support him, which Muhammad was happy to do. But the way this turned out was so much more horrific than anybody could have predicted. So at the end of the trial, which lasted 15 long, grueling weeks, 
both sides came to their closing arguments and the jury was sent off for deliberations. After deliberations, the jury found that Ansarine Bakari, Mahek Bakari, Raiz Jamal, and Rakan Karwan were all guilty of two counts of murder. The two males that were found guilty were because Raiz was the one driving the seat Leon, while Rakan was the one who gathered the rest of the defendants to participate. Meanwhile, Sanaf Gulamastafa, Amir Jamal, and Nakasha Akhtar were found guilty of of two counts each of manslaughter. At the sentencing hearing, the judge stated that Mahek's cheap fame as a social media influencer made her, quote, utterly self-obsessed with a wholly unjustified sense of entitlement and no apparent awareness of the impact you have on others, oblivious to the damage you do going on to say, the prosecution were right to categorize this case as a cold-blooded murder. The fact that they locked behind bars is clearly a relief. However, there's no real justice because my beloved baby brother will never come back. The court heard it was a crime of love, obsession and extortion. 46-year-old and Sreen had been having a secret affair with 21-year-old Hussein. When he threatened to leak explicit photos of her to her husband, she and her daughter lured him to a car park and recruited a group to steal his phone. Instead, they chased the victim's car at high speed, eventually running it off the road, killing both men in a fiery crash. We have seen continued lies and deceit from the defendants as they tried to evade responsibility for the killings. They showed complete disdain for the lives of their victims. In the end, the defendants were given the following sentence. Mahak and Raiz will both serve life with a minimum of 31 years. Rakan will serve life with a minimum of 26 years. And Serene will also serve life with a minimum of 26 years. Sanaf and Amir will each serve 14 years, while Natasha will serve 11 years. So that is all of the information we have on today's case. This was definitely a wild one from start to finish. I think it's clear that May's TikTok fame got to her head and really made her feel untouchable. She felt that she could do whatever she wanted and no one would make her face the consequences. Her mother felt like she also could do whatever she wanted, i.e. cheating on her husband. But when she came face to face with having to take accountability, both her and her daughter decided that they shouldn't have to do that. They shouldn't have to face their own actions. Yes, Saqib threatening to blackmail them was wrong. 100% I will not deny that. But I wholeheartedly agree with the prosecution when they say that this could have gone so many other ways. They could have gone to the authorities like they originally planned. Instead, they not only took the life of Saqib, but they took the life of Muhammad, a young man who had absolutely nothing to do with this. Now, the people responsible for the murder will be behind bars for the rest of their lives, while everyone else involved will spend a good chunk of time behind bars as well for something they had absolutely nothing to do with. Imagine spending 14 years to life in prison for getting involved in a friend's drama. This case also serves as a good example for why it is best to just mind your own business. But you all heard what I think. Now I want to know your thoughts. What do you think of this case overall? What do you think of the blackmail that started all of this? Do you agree with the verdicts for murder? If not, why? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Spotify. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.